No discussion of the Civil War is complete without a discussion of the mini ball and its importance. The mini ball was a bullet, and it had such destructive power that it entered the body, leaving a hole the size of a thumb, exited, leaving a hole the size of a fist. That was a medical challenge. Let's take a look at what went on with wounds and disease. I'm Robert Hicks, director of the Mütter Museum and Historical Medical Library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. And welcome to another episode of Broken Bodies, Suffering Spirits, Injury, Death, and Healing in Civil War Philadelphia. We've learned a great deal about the techniques of amputation, the effects of projectiles on injury to tissue and damage to bones and vital structures. The, the mini ball particularly was a vicious missile and it had a very soft uh, skirt uh, on the underside of it. And so when this thing uh, rolled down the barrel, the skirt engaged the, the screws and the threads inside of the rifles. And uh, this thing then hit at a very uh, terrible impact and the skirt spread and splattered. And so now you have a big missile, not a ball, but you have a big a flat missile. And it just shredded skin, bone, muscle, blood vessels. And of course, that meant then that they had to amputate a lot more because they were worried about gangrene. We've learned a great deal about surgery, and we've learned a great deal about where we can't do surgery and where we have gaps in our, in our medical knowledge. On the field, we learned how to triage soldiers. And sadly, much of the triage was the result of our inability to effectively perform surgical procedures on the brain, on the chest, on the abdomen, where those wounds were nearly always mortal. And sadly, the soldiers must be set aside to um, uh, almost fend for themselves, uh, except for comfort and, uh, and support. Surgery was extremely limited. And it was extremely limited because if they got anywhere near the chest cavity, penetrated, for example, to try to remove a, a bullet or a ball. They dared not do that because they did not have any way to support breathing. They had no way to re-expand lungs that would have been collapsed, and they surely would have introduced infection. They went right through the skin. They didn't have any idea about sterilization or, any, or even aseptic technique at that point. So chest invasion was out no matter what. We did most of our surgery under anesthesia. There, was, uh, there were chemicals available to us to um, uh, render the soldier uh, unaware of his surroundings and uh, relieve his pain in the uh, uh, immediate effects of the surgery. But oftentimes they would become agitated and we would need one or more stewards, sisters, local citizens to help us restrain the soldier as he became agitated during the anesthetic procedure and the, and the amputation procedure. Ether and chloroform were, at least in the north, were most widely available pretty much everywhere except where you got Gettysburg where you had 50,000 casualties in three days. Well, they were out of everything, including drinking water with that. And Antietam was another one. It was just, just a dreadful, acute thing. If they had a chronic siege, for example, like Vicksburg, where they could kind of get through it over many months, that was not so much of a problem, but that's another misconception. They had a lot of anesthesia and they used it. Perhaps what we've learned the most is how to organize the care of medicine. We have created uh, enormous hospitals with thousands of beds, uh, pavilions in which soldiers in row after row uh, are cared for by um, uh, nurses, doctors, stewards, and recovered from injuries that uh, might not have been possible uh, during earlier conflicts. We are with Kathleen Foster, the curator of American art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we are here with a very important painting. Kathleen, why is this an important painting of the 19th century? 
Well, it's simply the very best painting by the best artist of Philadelphia. So it's a trophy for the entire city. But it's also his debut painting, in a way. It's the most important picture of his young career, a picture that he made for the Centennial Exposition. It was displayed in the medical display of the Centennial, in a reproduction of a U.S. Army medical post, where it was rammed in into the middle of a model ward with hospital beds. What does this painting say about the stature of a physician, a surgeon at this time, and the state of American medicine? Well, obviously, Aikens respected Gross very highly, but he was not just the average surgeon. He was the senior professor at the largest medical school in the United States, and an innovator, a writer, and so all of these things contributed to his eminence in the United States at this time. What is the significance of this painting for the history of medicine? It's a picture that shows a teaching doctor um, using a clinic system that had been used in France. And so this is Dr. Gross teaching with his clinic around him to a gallery of medical students, which was uh, the most modern way of teaching medicine at the time. Dr. Gross himself is also an innovator who had pioneered the particular procedure that he's demonstrating here of uh, an osteomyelitis surgery. Um, and he is shown, obviously, as a master of his trade.